I made a mess. Randall's cleaning up my mess because Angie's not here and not in this room. <laughs> I need it. Okay, so let's, uh, we'll go live here. So, okay, so just want to welcome everyone in person and online. And uh, I'm excited about this message and the series. As probably you know, as I've said over the past several weeks, that we're going to be starting a series called The Day of His Power, and that title comes from Psalms 110. And in fact, if you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and turn to Psalms 110. Psalms 110 is going to be the launching point for this series we're going to do where we go in depth and we're going to look at Revelation chapter 7, Revelation chapter 12, Revelation chapter 14, Revelation 11. We're going to go into, into that into, into depth today. And so... The day of his power is a very important phrase that I, I don't think a lot of Christians understand, to be honest. But I want to start reading in Psalms 110, where, where David expresses a prophetic psalm. Psalms 110 is an incredible psalm if you haven't read it. I encourage you to read it. I encourage you to pray over it. I encourage you to, to ask the Lord to give you understanding of it. But David is, is likely in the tabernacle of David, strumming his heart before the glory of God in the tabernacle. And the, the prophetic spirit of the Lord comes upon David. And David pens a, a psalm. It's only seven verses, but it's incredibly prophetic. And it's, in fact, it's foretelling of the day and hour we live in. We haven't yet entered into this fully, but ever so closely, ever uh, ever so fastly, it seems, we're moving swiftly into this day where the Lord gives dominion to the Lord Jesus Christ. So starting in verse 1, the Lord says to my Lord, you can think of it as this way, the Father says to the Son, that's really what David is saying here, the Father says to the Son, sit at my right hand, until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Now, what is really going on here, this does not mean that Jesus is going, some people te teach that Jesus is going to remain in heaven until every enemy of his is defeated. And, and that's not true. That's not true. That's not what this psalm is saying. What, what the Father means or what David meant by this, sit at my right hand, it means, what he was saying is reign, rule until all of your enemies are defeated. Now, this has not yet been initiated. This prophecy has not yet been fulfilled, but we are moving into that day described in Revelation chapter 11 where, the, where you, a voice was heard from heaven. You have taken your great power and you have begun to reign. There, and I talked about this on the July 7th message. In fact, if you haven't listened to the message from July 7th or from July 21st, I would, I would recommend that just as a background to this message. But you have taken your great power and you have begun to reign. That's, that, that statement is made towards the very end of the great tribulation before the Lord returns. But what, what we see from that statement is the power of God breaks in before that moment and God begins to reign in the midst of his enemies. Does that make sense? So I talked about that in that message. So the father says to the son, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. In other words, reign until all of your enemies are defeated. Now the last enemy that is defeated, Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians 15, is death. And that is defeated at the resurrection, the very last resurrection of the dead after the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ. And that's what really, it's really what we see here. This prophecy is spanning from about three and a half years prior to the Lord's second coming all the way through to the thousand year reign of Christ until the last resurrection when the dead are raised in Christ. Those who have got saved in the millennium uh, are raised to life. And, that, and, and then death once and for all is defeated. That's the last enemy. But there are many enemies before that that the Lord must defeat. And that's what this psalm is talking about. It be, but it begins three and a half years before the Lord returns. In fact, I would say this, Psalm 110 and the book of Revelation go hand in hand. Psalm 110 and the book of Revelation go hand in hand. 
What you see here in Revelation, or in Psalm 110, 1 verse 1 and 2, is you see the, the beginning of the reign of Jesus Christ, which is paralleled with Revelation chapter 6 all the way to Revelation chapter 20. It's God taking his great power and beginning to reign. I would encourage you to do a study on that, to see that. It's really eye-opening to realize, okay, you have taken your great power and you've begun to reign. Revelation 6 through Revelation 20 unfolds the reign of Jesus Christ breaking into this earth in the midst of his enemies and God allowing the enemies of, of Jesus Christ to come to full maturity. So we know, don't we, that in the end time harvest that it's not only the maturing of the sons of God, but it's also the maturing of the sons of the devil. That's what, that's what the Lord said in Matthew 13, that the maturing of the sons of God are the wheat that come into full maturity, and the maturing of the tares are the sons of the devil that come into full maturity, exemplified in the reign of the Antichrist and the false prophet and all that is seen in, in Revelation of God's enemies. And we're seeing, we're beginning to see right now that distinguishing between those who are righteous and those who are unrighteous. We're beginning to see those who are of the devil and those who are of God. I mean, it's becoming very, very clear. I mean, if you can't see that, you might need a discernment check because it's becoming very clear who is beginning to mature as that wheat, as the mature sons of God, and who is beginning to mature as the tares, as those evil sons of the evil one. I mean, light and darkness is being... Uh, highlighted and contrasted like never before. I mean, that's the time we are living in right now that, uh, that, we are, that you can see this unfolding. And in verse 2, the Lord says, I will stretch forth your strong scepter from Zion, saying, rule in the midst of your enemies. The reign of the Messiah begins in the midst of his enemies. It doesn't begin after his enemies are defeated. It begins while his enemies have dominion and power. And the Lord's saying, rule in the midst of your enemies as your enemies are ruling and as your enemies are ex exerting influence and dominion, rule in their midst. Now here's where we come in, verse 3. We talked about that on, on July 7th. And this is where we get the name of this series, the day of your power. Verse 3, your people will volunteer freely. Oh, this is so beautiful you ca if you catch this. Your people, and this is what it means in the actual Hebrew, is your people will be free will offerings. What does that mean? That means that we will voluntarily give the Lord Jesus Christ our will. You know you can be saved. You know you can go to heaven you can be justified by faith alone in Jesus Christ and still retain your will and still justified by the blood and live partially for yourself and partially for the Lord. You know that's true. God is raising up an army that says, we don't want to live for ourselves any longer. We're offering up to you, Lord, our free will. Like we sing about, Lord, you can have it all. You can have it all. You can have me. You can have all of me, every single thing that I am, all that I am, my thoughts, my will, my choices, what I want, when I want it, how I want it. Lord, they are yours. They are yours. That's going to be the type of people that comprise the army of God that he's raising up in these last days, in the day of his power. They are free will offerings. They're volunteering freely. They're saying, God... Here's my will. Here's my free will. I surrender all. All that I am, I surrender to you. You can have every single thing of me. Be, truly be Lord of my life experientially, not just with mere words. Because the Lord said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? What I'm talking about is, is a people who come into full obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ. Not just by mere lip service, but by action by works, by faith, accompanied by works that accompany faith. Not just being forgetful hearers, but effectual doers. In the church today, we're, the churches around the world are filled with forgetful hearers. They hear a message every single Sunday, and 
they forget it after their Sunday nap. And the, the fact is, they, the, the Word of God is not put on flesh in them, and that Word of God is not incarnated, so to speak, in them to be worked out and worked out of them into works of faithfulness that demonstrate their faith, that demonstrate that Christ is Lord. But God's raising up an army. God's raising up an army who will, that will volunteer their free will. Then we see here, he says, in the day of your power, that word in the Hebrew, actually, and I said this on July the 7th, that word in the Hebrew can be translated into a powerful army or into an army of power. So God is raising up an army with power. That is not an army with physical weapons, okay? We got to say this because YouTube, people on YouTube will take, uh, you know, a clip and like, he's talking about a physical army, a militia. No, I'm not talking about any of that. I'm talking about a spiritual army. Our weapons are not of the flesh, but they are mighty through God for the pulling down of strongholds. I'm talking about a spiritual army with the greatest power that has ever been entrusted to mere mortals, greater than what Moses experienced, greater even than what the apostles experienced in the first century. God, what he's raising up for this last end time army is a power like we have never seen before. It's called the day of his power. Now, don't get in your mind one of the things that hinders us from seeing what I'm talking about is we get into our minds what we see on Christian TV, TV or TBN where these guys are using the so it's probably not even the power of God. Most of it's fake, fake. Some of it may be God. Some of it, I'm not going to get into all that. But basically using the power of God to build their own ministries to, so they can get wealthy and make a name for themselves. That's not what I'm talking about now. I'm talking about the power that was on the apostles. The power that when Peter walked by, his shadow, just his shadow merely healed someone. Just the, the power that was in Paul's handkerchief when he put it and they sent it out, that evil spirits were fleeing and people were getting healed. The power where the apostles said, you know, we don't, have, we don't have silver and gold, but what we do have is we have in the name of Jesus Christ, rise and walk. Unfortunately, it's been reversed today. We have the silver and gold, but we have, don't have the power. God is going to change that and release the most incredible power and authority this world has ever witnessed, greater than Moses, greater than Acts, combined together and multiplied on it all throughout the world in what is described here as the army of God's power. So if you think the end times are scary and if you think the end times are depressing and if you think the end times are discouraged, you're right. <laughs> but there's something even greater, the day of his power. We've only heard half the story. We've only heard the darkness that's rising up. We haven't seen the light that's coming. We are living in the greatest days in church history. I'm telling you, the great cloud of witnesses are looking down upon us and going, we are jealous that you get to live in the time when the prophets of what they said thousands of years ago are coming to pass right before your very eyes. We live in those days right now. Amen. Amen. You were born, I know this is cliche in Christianity, but you were born truly for such a time as this. You were born for this very moment, hour, and day. So therefore, don't be discouraged. Don't be depressed. God is raising up an army of great power, the army of power that's going to initiate the second coming of Jesus Christ. It's not just, we're not just called to be spectators who are watching God sovereignly unfold the book of Revelation himself. No, what we are called to be is participators who are partnering with Jesus Christ and what he's doing from heaven and partnering with him to see these, these events unfold and becoming the people that he talks about in this book we're supposed to be. We're not called to be spectators but participators. In the day of his power... They will volunteer freely in the day of his power. They will be free will offerings. They will be what? Bond servants. 
What does Revelation 7 talk about? Talk about they, these are bond servants. These are bond servants. If you don't know about a bond servant, a bond servant was liberated from servitude, servitude and out of his own free will, because he loved his master, he said, you know what, I have freedom, but because I love my master, I want to be your servant for life. And then the master then marked that slave in his right ear and said, now you are my bondservant. That's what God is looking for in his army. Bondservants, they follow the lamb wherever he goes. They follow the lamb wherever he goes. See, in America, we've, in America, American Christianity, we want to try to fit Jesus into our life. But Jesus cannot fit into your life. He must become your life. It doesn't work by you trying to fit Jesus into your life. He must become your life. He must become the very life source you live by. That's what it means to be a bondservant. We follow the lamb wherever he goes. Now he says, in continuing on here in Revelation or in Psalm 110, he says, in holy array, this army of power is not going to be what we've seen in the past where people have a measure of power, but they have no internal holiness. They have no character. They basically have no fruit of the Spirit. They have power without fruit. That's not what this army is going to be. This army is going to be an army of character. This army is going to be an army of Christ-likeness. This army is going to be a people that have been conformed into the image and the likeness of Jesus Christ. This army is going to be a people that are living the Sermon on the Mount lifestyle, living and they've been formed when no one else has been looking, formed into the very image of Jesus Christ when no one can see. This army is going to be like Christ. And because this army is like Christ in holiness and in sanctification, God is going to give this army a power like we have never seen. Revelation 12.10, now the power has come. Now the kingdom has come. Now the authority has come. Now the salvation has come. God is going to entrust that type of power authority to this army because they are dressed in holy array. They have the nature of the Lamb formed in them. Their carnality has gone to the cross. They've experienced sanctification. The cross has worked in them unto full sanctification. The power of the cross. The cross is the power of God to those who are being saved. The cross has worked in them unto sanctification. The Spirit has put their flesh to death and he is risen up in, him, in them as Christ is. The, the, the manifestation of the Spirit of Christ possessing and filling and living in and through them. They are dressed in holiness. The next phrase, from the womb of the dawn. Now that almost seems like, what does that even mean? That's just so obscure. It's poetry. doesn't have much meaning. Nothing's further from the truth. From the womb of the dawn, I want you to think of Revelation chapter 12, where John sees a woman clothed in the sun, having an overcomer's crown, a Stephanos crown with 12 stars. The moon is under her feet. She's pregnant with a mature son. The, the son that comes out of her isn't a, isn't a small infant baby. It's a mature son. This, this son, she gives birth to a, a mature son. She's pregnant. She's in travail. What is this woman? The womb of the dawn. This womb of the dawn that gives birth to this fully formed Christ-like company of overcomers. You see that? The womb of the dawn that is signaling a new day's coming. Yes, the hour is dark. Yes, deep darkness is covering the people. Yes, the world has plunged into a level of insanity that I don't think we've ever seen. Yes, Romans chapter 1 is being lived out in full measure across the nations on social media, YouTube. We're witnessing Romans chapter 1 is in fact real. And Romans chapter 1 is coming into fullness of the total depravity of man and men and women, total depravity being coming into full maturity. Yes, we're seeing the total depravity. 
Yes, deep darkness is covering the earth. But I'm telling you, in the midst of this darkness, there is a womb of the dawn. And this womb of the dawn inside this womb of the overcoming church, inside of this womb is a mature son, is a Christ-like son. But it's not just one son. It's a company of sons who are being formed in this womb in hiddenness and obscurity where no eye can see. They are coming into the full measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Jesus Christ. They are coming into full representation and full uh, expression of the headship of Jesus Christ. There is divine authority in this company. There is divine authority that God is giving to this company. They are, I believe, as I'm going to explain later, God's end time apostles. Now, we hear the word end time, we hear the word apostle, unfortunately, over the last 20 years. If you've grown up in the charismatic church, that is like the most... Uh, chalk, uh, like fingernails on a chalkboard word you could possibly think. You know, everyone and their brother has a, a, on their business card, I'm an apostle of this, I'm an apostle of that. You know, it's like if you go to some meetings in Africa, nine out of ten people are so-called apostles. And, you know, you've seen just the, the, the error of all that. That's not, that is not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about apostles who are going to take over the seven mountains of culture or marketplace apostles who are going in and going to take possession of the mountain of religion or the mountain of finance. That is not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about what Paul said in 2 Corinthians about the super apostles or the super apostles thought they were some special breed of apostle. That's, that is not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about false apostles. I'm not talking about super apostles. I'm talking about the true biblical apostolic apostles who are rising up at the end, end, of, the, end, of, the, end of the age. I almost did a tongues message there. At the end of the age, they're rising up as apostles that God can entrust his authority to them. They're not going to take the authority of Jesus Christ and abuse the church. Unfortunately, that like what is being exposed in this present hour in church abuse, scandal after scandal that's uncovering the abuse of authority by leaders that people put their trust in, and now they're being exposed for who they really are, using their platform and their position for, for money, for fame, for fortune, for sex, for all kinds of terrible things. That is not what I'm talking about. God's apostles that are rising up are hidden. God's apostles right now are in obscurity. God's apostles right now are hidden in that womb of formation called the womb of the dawn. But they're going to be birthed here at the end of the age. And God is going to use this group of end time apostles as generals in this army in the day of his power. And God is going to entrust into them the authority of Jesus Christ, he's going to bring them and use them because they have no other agenda but Christ, no other agenda but the Lamb. They are bond servants of his. They are not in it for themselves. They have no agenda, no, uh, no purpose. They don't have a vision statement. They plastered up to try to grow their congregation. Their vision is Jesus Christ. Their vision is a people who would re reflect him and represent him. He's their vision. Not a corporate vision you see that is, that's uh, like, almost like resembling corporate America that has uh, been characterized the church. Hey, our vision is da-da-da-da. It's like you sound more like a corporate American than you do the church of Jesus Christ. Christ is their vision. Christ is their mission. To be possessed of Christ. To be fulfill, filled with Christ. To come into the full measure of the stature of Christ. That's what they're living for. That's who they're living for. This woman is the womb of the dawn. I believe it's the overcoming church. I'm going to get into all that in many, many, much in more detail. This is just an opening session. It's, it's a womb of the dawn. It's, the dawn being is the signaling of a new day. Darkness is covering the earth, yes. Deep darkness is covering the earth, yes. Have you seen the Olympics? Have you seen the opening ceremony, which was unwatchable because it was so perverted? Have you seen the Olympics where they, they parade out the white horse and the nations are behind him? 
I'm like, dear God, have they been listening to Terry Bennett and Chris Reed prophesying the things they've been prophesying? Maybe they have. I don't know. Or maybe they're tapped into the devil who knows the times and the seasons because that was incredibly prophetic of the hour we live in. The Antichrist system is rising up right now. The, the seventh kingdom that will, from which the Antichrist will emerge is rising up right now that will give birth to the ten kings and the Antichrist. It's rising up. We are in a war right now. So much of this war is centered upon a globalist attempt to take over the, the nations of the earth and bring in global government that the book of Revelation talks about. So much of the nonsense and craziness we are seeing in our own country is because that globalist agenda has infiltrated into this country at the highest level and taken over. This has been over several decades, if you study it. And now we're at a war for the sovereignty of America because America must be weakened for this global kingdom to rise up. That's the war we are in right now. Hope you can see what's going on. We are living truly at the very threshold of the end of the age. But God has a solution. God has a solution. It's not super apostles. Sometimes you hear the word apostle and it's like, almost like they're describing the Avengers movie. Like someone's going to be like Captain America, someone's going to be Thor, someone's going to be Spider-Man. Uh, Thor, I don't think he's even an Avenger. I forget all the Marvel stuff mixes in. But uh, Iron Man, Captain America, Spider-Man, uh, yeah, whoever else the other ones are. Uh, the guy that shoots the bow in the arrow, what's uh, Greenland? Oh, what's this guy's name? Anyway, yeah, I, I fall asleep during movies all the time, so I sleep through some of that. But anyway, some people make it out like these apostles or they're going to be these Avengers that come like the a movie, the Marvel series. It's like, no, they're going to be the scum of the earth and the dregs of society. They're going to be like, like Paul said in 1 Corinthians, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, or maybe 2 Corinthians chapter 4, they're going to be the last. They're going to be a spectacle to men and to angels. There's going to be nothing impressive about them. They're not going to have fire bolts and lightning coming out of their hands. No, they're going to be weak. They're going to be humble. But there's going to be in them a supernatural power. There's going to be in them the conformity into the image of the Lamb. And God is going to use these end-time apostles to bring the entire church into what God wants. God must have apostles and prophets. God must have true apostles and true prophets. Not the ones that we've seen, you know, like the Donald Trump prophecies where they clearly missed it and they didn't repent and they said, no, wait, no, it, just wait in March of 2021. No, wait, he's still the president in heaven and all that nonsense, all that garbage. God, that is not what God is raising up. It's not prophetic, it's pathetic. God's raising up true prophets. God's raising up true apostles to bring in the authority of Christ and to bring the church into what God wants. So I want to encourage you, yes, deep darkness is coming to your, uh, covering the earth. But from the womb of the dawn is emerging God's generals that are going to lead his end time army formed into the image of Christ hidden in obscurity, but coming out. And their, their one desire, like it talks about in Revelation 14, to follow the Lamb wherever He goes. Like it talks about in Revelation chapter 7, bond servants, no agenda, no plan B, nothing but Christ. We're, we're living to do what he wants. We have, no, we have nothing, no agenda, no plan. What's the Lord saying? Because that's what we're going to do. That's what's coming forth out of this womb of the dawn. You, the, your youth are to you as the dew. I'm, I'm not going to read the rest of, uh, I'll, I'll skip down to, well, let me just go ahead and just read it. Yeah. The Lord has sworn, verse 4, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. It's talking, talking to Jesus. You are a priest forever. According to the order of Melchizedek. I think it's interesting. Verse 3 goes right to verse 4. Because yes, Jesus Christ is a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. But this army 
God is raising up will also function in the order of Melchizedek. What does that mean? That basically means this. You can just do a study on this, but that basically means the offices of the, of the king and the priest are now merged into one office. Because before Melchizedek, before the Melchizedek priesthood, it was a Levi priesthood. The Levi priesthood was a priesthood unto God, but they had no kingly authority. The king had no priestly uh, responsibility. And you, you can look at it even in uh, um, the Isaiah chapter 6. When, he, you, when Uzziah died, he died because as a king he got presumptuous to go into the priest's function and to offer incense to the, to the Lord. The Lord's like, you can't do that. And he was struck with leprosy until the day of his death. But the Lord is saying there is a new order of priesthood rising up. And this order of priesthood merges together both the king and the priest. That means our first ministry is vertical unto the Lord. And out of that place of ministry to the Lord, out of that place of vertical ministry to the Lord, our ministry first is not to people but to the Lord. Out of that ministry to the Lord, these, mer these come forth with governmental authority, with kingly authority to exercise the kingdom of God and the exercise of the kingdom of God into their domain of influence. Verse 5. The Lord is at your right hand. And this, this is now talking about Jesus. He is going, Jesus is going to shatter kings in the day of his wrath. What's he talking about? The day of the Lord. What's he talking about? Revelation chapter 6. When John saw the scroll opened, he saw the moon, he saw the sun become black and the moon turned to blood. And it says that the inhabitants of the earth realize we are in trouble. The lamb has risen up. The great day of his wrath has, has come. And they begin to hide themselves in the, in the hills and the mountains trying to escape God's wrath. That's when this is. That's when this context is. Is he will judge the nations. He will fill them with corpses. Now, we hope that they will repent. And in fact, this army that God is raising up to, in that last three and a half years, that army will be entrusted with the eternal gospel that will call the nations to repentance. And many, in fact, it's so innumerable that will turn and repent that John says it's too great to count. They're coming up out of the great tribulation and they're washing their robes in the blood of the Lamb and they're making them white. It's too great to even count. So, yes, there is going to be an incredible move of God leading to repentance, leading to sanctification, leading many to salvation, leading many away from the, from the wrath of God into the salvation of God through Jesus Christ. But for those who will not repent, the wrath of the Lamb is surely coming. For those who do not obey the gospel of Jesus Christ, the wrath of God is surely coming. That is the context in which Psalms 110 is set. When does Psalms 110 take place? In the day of God's wrath. Revelation chapter 6 onward. When the day of his power, this army of power is birthed through the womb of the dawn, through the overcoming church in Revelation chapter 12, those who will rule the nations with a rod of iron. She gives birth to those overcomers. Are you with me? That was encouraging. <laughs> Are you with me? I thought you were with me. Okay. Well, that's just the introduction. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm just kidding. That is, uh, we got just a few more minutes. What I want to do for the rest of today is just talk about some of the key things that Psalms 110 branches out. I, I believe when you see Revelation 12, Revelation 14, Revelation chapter 7, Revelation chapter 11, what you're seeing is Psalms 110 expounded upon in much greater detail. <clears throat> in fact, I want to encourage you to read, read that from that light, is put on those lenses and say, okay, Psalms 110 is unfolded in Revelation 12, 14, 7, and 11. I think as we get through this in more detail, I'm going to do a lot more of a, a teaching to unpack why I believe this, and we'll go through line upon line and all that. 
but I'm just trying to paint the picture right now so that when I paint this picture and when I go into some of that detail, you understand, okay, this is why he's doing it. Because what I found, if we don't know the why behind a message, we don't know the why behind the what, we'll easily zone out and say, okay, well, how does this even apply to me? What is even, the, why do I even need to hear this? I'm telling you, this is why. Because God has a plan. God has a blueprint of the end times that is hardly ever talked about in the church. Yet here we are at the very threshold of all these things unfolded. See, what I'm talking about is not something that's happened, going to happen like so many years into the future. What I'm talking about is now forming right now. This is not like 30 years from now when you're dead, <clears throat> whatever, I'm dead or old or whatever. It has no relevance right now. No, this is unfolding right now. These things, this army of power doesn't just automatically, sovereignly, magically, uh, you know, appear at the last three and a half years of the age fully trained and equipped. Sometimes the Christians, we think, we don't think very practically. We think very theologically and, you know, that's okay. But there's some practical things. God is forming this army right now. See, this, this church, this, the, what I'm talking about the, in Revelation chapter 12 is this woman. This woman, she's pregnant. She's in heaven. She's got the, the and I don't believe she's literally in heaven where God is. She's just is pictured in heaven where there's spiritual warfare. She's clothed with the sun. The moon is under her feet. She's got the crown, the Stephanos crown, which is the crown that's given to the victor in athletic games. You know, we're watching the Olympics right now. You win, you get a gold medal. Well, back in that day, if you won, you got a Stephanos crown. And that Stephanos crown says you were the victor. You won the victory. You were the gold medal champion. That's what this woman is crowned in. She has a crown with uh, 12 stars. She is, in other words, this woman is the overcomers. It's the corporate overcomers at the time of this vision, when this vision takes place. The, this woman is like Hannah. She's pregnant with a Samuel, so to speak. She's in travail with a Samuel, so to speak. A, a Samuel, if you know about Samuel, Samuel was dedicated to the Lord. Samuel was devoted to the Lord. In other words, Sam, uh, Hannah was buried, and she said, Lord, if you will give me a child, I will devote him to you. And the Lord took her up on that promise, and she gave birth to Samuel. Samuel was a new breed of a prophet. Samuel confronted Eli in his blindness and said, you must repent. And because of all the issues in the Eli priesthood, Eli's priesthood was, was brought under the judgment of the Lord. We're witnessing that right now. God is bringing judgment to the house of God. God is raising up a Samuel. God is raising up a new order of apostolic and prophetic leadership that is not going to tolerate the old system. Samuel was not of the old system. The old system must, must die. The old system of churchianity must die. Listen, God is never going to get what he wants out of the old system of called Christianity. The old system that's trying to build their own ministries and build their own platforms in the name of Jesus Christ. God will never, ever get what he wants out of that system, ever. That's why we've got to come outside of the camp, outside into the wilderness where the John the Baptist are speaking and where the other prophetic voices are speaking and outside of the camp of the familiar called Christianity, outside of that system and that organization that's all about the man and his ministry, the man and his platform using the name of Jesus to build his own kingdom. God will never, ever partner with that. Yeah, he might bless it. He might, he might bless some things here and there. No, that you, if you, like it says in Hebrews chapter 13, you must come outside of the camp. You've got to come outside of what is called Christianity into true biblical Christianity, outside of the system that is using the name of Jesus for their own purposes and ministry. That was like Samuel. Samuel confronted the priesthood of Eli and said, you're living in sin. Your sons are living in sin. You have become blind. You can't even see, Eli. You have become blind. The Eli priesthood that are, have become blind to the condition they are in and their sons are in and the church is in. God's exposing that right now. God is raising up a new breed of apostolic and prophetic leadership, a Samuel in the womb of Hannah presently right now, in the womb of the overcoming church. She's in travail. What did Samuel do? 
Samuel exposed Saul, and Samuel anointed David. This corporate Samuel is a John the Baptist vessel that is preparing the way for the greater David. This John the Baptist vessel that God is raising up in all the nations of the earth right now, hidden though right now, in obscurity though right now, are going to come onto the scene like it talked about John the Baptist. And, and until the day of his public appearing, he was in the wilderness. God is going to raise up all around the world a corporate John the Baptist who will prepare the way of the Lord and he will anoint like Samuel. He will anoint and prepare the way for the greater David to come who will rule from Zion and Jerusalem for a thousand years. This womb of the dawn, this woman pregnant is like Mary in whom Christ was being formed in obscurity. In obscurity, God is raising up a leadership that is a different breed, a different form of leadership. These are God's end-time generals. They are being formed into a corporate expression and representation of Christ in fullness. They are becoming like the Lamb, meek and humble and self-sacrificing. They are becoming conformed into His image when no one can see because God is giving birth to this Son. They are an Elijah army. See, Malachi chapter 4 says that I am going to send Elijah before the great and terrible day of the Lord. And I'm going to go into this in the teaching later on. But if you really study the context, there's no way that's only talking about one person, Elijah the, Elijah the Tishbite. I believe it's talking about a corporate people that God will release all around the earth that will be like a John the Baptist vessel that will be anointed with the very spirit and power of Elijah that was on Elijah, and they will be entrusted with the eternal gospel like it talks about in Revelation 14, which is not just the gospel of salvation. The gospel of salvation is part of it, but it's something that's even more expansive, expansive than that. It is the eternal purpose of God. It is the eternal blueprint of God. It is what God destined before time and creation, and salvation is only how we get back into God's original intention. This Elijah army will have the power of the spirit and power of Elijah to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. I want you to just get the vision of this. They will be anointed to minimize. This is what's so interesting. They were both going to be used to partner with the Lord in releasing his judgments and minimizing his judgments. God's heart is to minimize the judgments of the Lord. God's, God's, God's heart is to call the nations to repentance. This, this army will be an Elijah army that will be calling the nations to repentance to minimize the judgment of the Lord, to minimize that God's having to pour out his wrath. God wants to minimize. God wants to lead many to repentance, and he will lead many to repentance. We're about to see the greatest move of God in history through this vessel. <laughs> Revelation 14 John saw an angel flying in mid-heaven. It's interesting that this is revealed after Revelation 14, 1 through 5, where, where the lamb is with the 144,000. They are the first fruits of the harvest. They are the, they are the ones who come to maturity before the majority. <clears throat> and, and then you see Revelation chapter 14, verse 6. The angel has the eternal gospel. Why? Because the angel entrusts these 144,000 with the preaching of that eternal gospel. I, would, I encourage you, read Revelation 7 and Revelation 14 and see the parallels. They're really striking. This 144,000 who I, and I'm going to unpack this in, in, in much more detail over the next six to eight weeks. I don't believe it's the 12 ethnic tribes of Israel. I'll explain that on July the 7th, so you can go back and reference that for, if you want to <clears throat> see that. But I, I believe it's a, it is, a, a, it is the God's generals of his end-time army, the apostolic generals that God's raising up. They're going to be entrusted with the eternal gospel. That gospel is the gospel of the kingdom. You know, you remember Jesus said in Matthew 24, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all nations as a witness 
and then the end will come. The gospel of the kingdom is greater than the gospel of salvation. That sounds like I'm against the gospel of salvation. Nothing could be further from the truth. I'm writing a book about the gospel of salvation right now. So, but the gospel of salvation was only God's means to restore us back into his eternal purpose, his ultimate intention to have a people that would be his bride, the bride of the lamb, fully made ready, to be a people that come into full sonship, not just immaturity, not just being the technon of God, the, in, the immature child that stays in their condition. But no, God is raising up sons who've come into sonship. Weos is the word in the Greek. They've come into sonship, and they're being prepared to be placed as sons into God's, into, into the inheritance of Jesus Christ. I wrote all about that in, in the eternal blueprint. If you want to read that, I'll give you a free copy of that. Just let me know. Only in person, not online. You've got to buy it online. <sighs> God is raising up sons. That's his eternal purpose. He's bringing these sons under the rod of his discipline, not because he's mad or angry. No, because he is wanting to drive away the selfishness and the immaturity and all that is of the sin nature. He's driving all of that out to raise up sons who, in, in whom he can trust. Did you realize God can't trust most of his children? He loves them, but he can't trust them. Does God trust you? Or does God only love you? Now, we want both. <clears throat> we don't have to choose. But God cannot trust most of his children because of our condition, because of our, our immaturity, because of our selfish ways. So what does he do? He puts us under a child trainer, the Holy Spirit. And that child trainer drives out the immaturity. That child trainer confronts and corrects and disciplines those he loves. If you feel like God's under, you're under God's discipline, that's incredible. That means you're not illegitimate. That means you're not just some wandering child. That means God has a plan for you. God has a purpose for you. He's bringing you into sonship. He's bringing you into maturity. He's bringing you into the full stature of Christ. If you are experiencing the discipline of the Lord and his correction, it's not his rejection. So, so often we think God's correction is his rejection. Or if God's correction comes even through leaders, that, oh no, he's, he's rejecting us. The furthest from the truth. If you are experiencing the correction of the Lord, it's because he's bringing you into sonship. If you respond to that correction, you can become mature sons who have been proven under the hand of the Lord in his governmental authority so that you can be trusted. If God is bringing you under discipline, it's because, listen, he doesn't trust you. If you're experiencing the discipline of the Lord, it's because he doesn't trust you. Well, that's offensive. No. If you could see what God has in store to place you into eternal intimacy, eternal authority, eternal glory, then you would say, God, bring the rod to me in fullness. I don't encourage you to pray that. <clears throat> if you do, don't come to me for counseling because your life will probably be... Um, I'm kidding, but let the Lord just sur surrender to him. You don't have to pray that extreme of a prayer. God's good at bringing the rod in his own way. But Hebrews 12 talks about this. Don't faint when God is correcting you. God's correcting you because he doesn't trust you. But he wants to trust you. He wants to develop maturity in you. Because if he gave you what he wants to give you, you would ruin it and squander it in like 60 seconds. Because you don't have the maturity capable to handle what he wants to give you. So we say, Lord, bring 
Lord, we submit to your rod of discipline. We submit to your child training hand of discipline. Have your way. Bring forth this mature representation of your son in me so that I could come into full sonship so that, Lord, you could trust me. Well, this is the message that the 144,000, the God's bondservants, the generals of his end time army, the ones who've been marked out for war, I talked about that on July the 7th, this is the message that they're going to be entrusted with, the eternal gospel, the gospel of the kingdom that is going to be a witness to all the nations. As incredible as it has been to see the gospel and the, and the Bible translated into all these different languages, that has, for the most part, for the most part, that is not the gospel of the kingdom. The gospel of the kingdom and the eternal purpose are really synonymous. The gospel of salvation is part of that, but God is raising up end-time apostles, generals in his army, prophets, messengers, a John the Baptist vessel who will be sent out into the nations to preach the eternal gospel, the gospel of the kingdom, the gospel of what God wanted before time and creation, salvation being the means to which we are restored back to God's ultimate aim and intention. See, contrary to popular belief in Christianity, God did not God did not create the world to save you. God created the world for his ultimate intention, to be a son fully formed into the image of Christ, to be a bride made ready without spot, stain, or blemish. Salvation is the means to get you back onto that path of his ultimate intention. That's the gospel of the kingdom. That gospel will be preached in, in all of the nations. If you see in Revelation 6... The angel says he's given it the eternal gospel that will be preached to every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. That's given to these, this, the generals of this army. Revelation chapter 7, these bond servants then, you see what happens is coming up, same language as Revelation 6, coming up out of every tribe, tongue, people, and nation is a number too great to count. And they're washing their robes in the blood of the Lamb, and they're singing salvation to the very one who sits on the throne. And it says they've washed their robes. This is not just justification. This is not just salvation and regeneration. This is full, complete sanctification. And it says, for this reason, because they've washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb, for this reason, they are before the throne of God. They've been prepared as a holy of holies priesthood for the Lamb. They're not in the outer court where most of the church is today. They're not in the holy place characterized by the gifts of the Spirit and church activities anointed by the Holy Spirit. No, they've moved from the outer court of salvation, moved into the holy place marked by the gifts of the Spirit into the very holy of holies. They are before the throne ministering to him as his priest. They've been prepared as the bride during the great tribulation through this army of, that God is raising up, given birth to through the womb of the dawn, the 144,000, the end time apostles that God's raising up, the John the Baptist vessel. What a, sometimes it's hard to get some of this language. Sometimes the language is hard to articulate. Whether you want to call it an Elijah army, a John the Baptist vessel, end time apostles and prophets, generals in his army, all of those really are saying the same thing. But it's the leadership God is raising up in this hour to bring forth a glorious church. Okay, we've got about 30 more minutes here. Okay, there's so much more. <laughs> I've only gotten halfway through my notes, but I know you are, uh, I know 
You're, you're like my dog. When he gets hungry, he starts pawing. Okay, it's time to eat. I can, I can feel your paws screeching on the back of the chairs. It's time to eat. So um, the notes go into this in a much more, much more detail. And I'm going to, um, we're just going to linger on the subject for, for many weeks just to really get it get it really deep in us, really, really get it deep in us because there's so much here to unpack. It's a really a new concept that a lot of people are unfamiliar with. And so I just want to encourage you to, to come to this, come to this teaching with, a, with an open mind, but not so open your brains fall out. Don't, you know, don't come so gullible that you just accept everything I say, but, but look at it in scripture. I've been, I've been studying and developing this, this, this what I'm teaching about over a 20-year period plus, 25-plus year period. I've been thinking about this often, and working through complex things, and I'm just now just pouring it out like a fire hydrant to you, and it's just like, whoa, if you think it's so much. It is a lot. It is a lot. And so I would encourage you to be like the Bereans who said, okay, I, nothing you said I disagree with so, you know, so much, but I want to get into the Word, and I want to, I want to study this for myself, and I want to see, okay, what do I think the scriptures teach? Because here's the thing. You can hear me speak and you can hear me talk. You can like it or not like it. But until you get the word into your own heart and you plant the seed of that into your own heart, you will never get this. It'll, it, it's, I say this often. It's like all I am is a waiter at a restaurant reading you the menu. Here's what is on the menu. You can have filet mignon with... Uh, Bernay sauce, you can have, I better not say that because y'all are already hungry, but you can have seared scallops or whatever. But if all you do is read the menu and don't ever eat, it does you no good. You'll just go feed up on McDonald's Big Macs, sorry if you like this, but McDonald's Big Macs when you could have had filet mignon and Bernay sauce or seared scallops or whatever it is you love. So here's what I'm saying is, what I'm saying is, Take these notes, that they're on the YouTube channel, so they're on the YouTube for this message. The link should be on the YouTube. Dig into these, read these slowly, prayerfully, and ask the Lord to give you understanding and insight into this. And if anything you believe is not accurate after prayer, not just by, especially if you've come from a, a place where you've had a lot of teaching and training in the book of Revelation, your initial reaction, some of this stuff is going to be different from what the scholars teach. And if you've had that being ingrained into you, you, you're probably going to have a harder time receiving this. But if you haven't had that, you're going to have an easier time. But still, go back and make it a matter of prayer and say, Lord, show me the truth in this. God is unfolding the book of Revelation. I'm going to just, a couple quotes here. Well, actually, I'm going to save that for next week. So, anyway... We will end there, and um, God bless you. We'll, we'll say a prayer, and we'll, uh, we'll end it right there. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Lord, I'm praying that you would unfold this to us. There's so much here. Unfold this to us. Line upon line, we pray. Lord, I pray that you would give a spirit of wisdom and a spirit of revelation to everyone who would read and everyone who would watch, make it very, very clear to everyone that is hungry that we might see the revelation of Jesus Christ in this, we pray. We pray that in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. And one thing I want to just announce real quick. Um, we are going to make this into a, this is going to be a series, but we're going to make this into a class that we do for, um, in our Forerunner School that we're going to be talking about and discussing. I sent an email out to us in our Forerunner School, but if you're not in the Forerunner School and you want to discuss this class, go through this class, then just email us at info at restorationlife.org, info at restorationlife.org. If you want to be part of this class, part of this discussion, as we dive into this and talk about this in further detail. Anyway, God bless you. We'll see you next Sunday, and uh, we'll stop the online portion now. And uh, just remember, we have the tithe bucket in the back.